In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. It's with great joy that I wish to welcome you to the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Denver, Colorado, and a Merry Christmas to you all. On behalf of the Archbishop of Denver and the leadership of this archdiocese, and on behalf of myself as the Cathedral Rector and our staff, we want to welcome you to this pre-recorded broadcast of the Mass of Christmas Day. Wherever you find yourself in this state, or perhaps even around the world, we come to meet the Christ child, who is our God in the flesh, come to meet, to heal, to redeem, to save us. As we begin our celebration, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and still more wonderfully restored it. Grant, we pray, that we may share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever.
A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings glad tidings, announcing peace, bearing good news, announcing salvation, and saying to Zion, your God is king. Hark, your sentinels raise a cry. Together they shout for joy, for they see directly before their eyes the Lord restoring Zion. Break out together in song, O ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord comforts his people. He redeems Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. All the ends of the earth will behold the salvation of our God. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, in times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us through the Son, whom he made heir of all things, and through whom he created 
the universe, who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word. When he had accomplished purification from sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high, as far superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Or again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And again, when he leads the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing came to be. What came to be through Him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace, 
because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only Son, God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed him. The Gospel of the Lord. A most holy, happy, and blessed Christmas day to you all. I'm going to do something that might challenge you just a little bit on this Christmas morning. I'm going to do something that might be provocative, that might be hard for you. I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable. We'll get back to what form that will take, but I'll tell you the conditions are good an example is already set, for on this Christmas morning, you and I are celebrating the vulnerability of our God. One need look no further than the crib of Christ, the manger stall of Bethlehem, for we see our God come in the flesh. That little babe who knew the chill of the night, the roughness of the hay, who knows the cry of the animals, who knows the company of shepherds. This we one is our God, and this his humility, and that he draws near to us in the flesh, capable of suffering like us, dying like us, loving like us. This is the full proof of the vulnerability of your God. I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable like that. But who am I to ask you this Christmas morn to be vulnerable? Sometimes we need first an introduction. I'm Father Samuel Moorhead. I'm the rector of the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception here in Denver, Colorado, this beautiful church. Some of you are watching us on television locally here in the Denver area. Maybe you've been here, you've seen it. It's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, churches in the entire state of Colorado. Some, though, are watching this by YouTube. As I've come to learn and have been blessed with in the last year and a half, ever since the beginning of the current coronavirus pandemic, I've come to learn that people have been watching and have enjoyed great benefit from this Mass throughout the entire world. In fact, even this last year, as I began my role here as the rector, I began to experience what I can only call something of a pilgrimage. People coming from different parts of the United States of America, people coming from different parts of the world even to Denver. And as a part of their journey, they came here. They wanted to see the beautiful basilica, which they had seen so many times on YouTube. They wanted to come and be a part of this experience that they had been a part of virtually. And so wherever you find yourself this Christmas morning, know of my best Christmas wishes, know of my love. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Denver, and on behalf of Archbishop Samuel Aquila and all of us here in Denver, we wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas. In the life of the Archdiocese of Denver in the last four weeks during the time of Advent, that season of preparation, of expectation that led up to this day, we in this Archdiocese in Colorado have been undertaking an Archdiocesan-wide time of retreat. Every Sunday at every Catholic church, the priests and deacons were tasked with preaching on one theme and leading the people of God through a fourfold consideration of the very heart of the gospel, the central proclamation of the faith. Let me put it in brief synopsis to you this morning. In the first week, we considered the reality of creation, our creation and our creatureliness. You see, God is the creator of all things. He made all things, and nothing came to be but through him. That's what we've even heard of today in our readings, what we profess 
every Sunday and Holy Day in the Creed. God is the creator and maker of all things visible and invisible. And so we are blessed to have this consideration of how we are made, created in God's own image and likeness. You see, before God came around to making us, he had created everything else that is in creation. God made and created the cosmos. He made the solar system. He made all the good stars. He made the sun and the planets and the moon and everything that is around us. God made this good earth that you and I call home. God made all the things that would come up upon this earth, from the mighty Rocky Mountains that are here in Colorado to the teeming ocean depths that lie a thousand miles away, the great plains, the deserts, everything that is around us, God made all of this. God made the animals, the creepy crawly things. God made the plants. But when God wanted to come to his masterwork, what did God make and create? He made you. He made me. He made the human race. He made us in his image and likeness. What does that mean? It means that God made us with a mind to think with, an intellect to know truth, ultimately the greatest truth of all, God. That God made us with a will and a free will at that so that we could choose. And the greatest possible choice is love. So that using our mind, coming to know the truth, using our heart, we could choose to love what we know to be the truth, that we would come to know and to love God himself. That is the full, highest, and greatest capacity of a human being. It's a marvel of what we are. And God made us. This is who we are. We rejoice in this creatureliness. It means that we're not God. We didn't make ourselves. That we don't control our own destiny. But that God has made us in love. That was the first week. The second week was the plot twist. For you see, after God made us through our first parents, who by the tradition of the church and the witness of sacred scripture have named Adam and Eve, that in the second movement, we consider how we misused that free gift of our will to love. We found ourselves in the beginning in a garden of earthly paradise where God had planted us, our first parents, to know and love him. But the fallen angel, the leader of the fallen angels, that liar from the beginning, the devil, who would come as a serpent, not just a serpent, as a dragon, into the garden. He crept in and he tried to thwart God's good plan. Adam, where were you? Eve, what are you doing? The serpent comes to the woman. The man's also responsible. And so Adam and Eve are tempted. The form always looks the same across the ages. Does God really have your best end in mind would be the temptation of the devil? Why don't you choose your own happiness? Reach out and grasp for whatever you want. Do your will. Don't care about God's. And so human beings set their will against the will of God and chose their own artificial form of happiness and by that sin entered the world. By that brokenness came upon us and every one of us experienced that. If God made us for a harmony of relationships, now all of a sudden a disharmony has come upon us. All of a sudden, each one of us knows that there is a disharmony in our own hearts. Sometimes we're at war with ourselves, our minds and our affect, our psychology, our decisions are at war with our best instincts and our desires. Sometimes we're at war with each other, that even the people close to us, spouses, parents with their children, community members, that we are at odds. Sometimes that disharmony comes in the natural order of the world around us. That we fear the cosmos, we fear nature, we fear the weather, that we even fear little viruses that can do a lot of damage. And fourthly, because of this willful choice against God, a disharmony has come to us human beings between our very selves and our loving Creator. And so a rain of death, hell, and sin came upon the human race. We found ourselves under a curse. We found ourselves captured. And we had consented to it. 
And you see, there God could have left us. He could have left us in that predicament of being cut off, broken off from Him at war with ourselves, and under this curse captured. But did He? No. All the while, God's putting together a good plan. He's making a plan for our recovery, for our redemption, for our rescue. He's going to make promises of old to the people He forms through the Jewish nation. He's going to raise up patriarchs, great leaders of faith. He's going to send prophets, those who are going to speak with His very word and voice to not only tell of future events but announce His presence then and there. But as a part of those prophecies, we're going to hear such things as the prophecy of a Messiah, one who would come, an anointed one of God, who would help, heal, redeem, and save us. That He would be born at Bethlehem that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be called Emmanuel, God with us, that he would be a suffering servant who by his stripes would heal many, by his wounds, by his vulnerabilities, would make us new and whole. What you and I are celebrating on this Christmas morning is the very revelation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. For you see, that little babe whose face we behold in the cattle trough of Bethlehem is the fulfillment of the desire of every human heart, the longing of every nation, and the great promises tendered by God. That babe is hope fulfilled. We can see his face, and seeing his face we see the face of God. The path he chose to come was a path of vulnerability, of humility, of littleness, and trust in the ways of his Father as he also entrusted himself to us. Let us study briefly the vulnerability of our God that we see and celebrate, call upon, and live out of this Christmas day. He was first hidden in the womb of his immaculate mother, Mary. Oh, in her we rejoice, for Mary's yes opened the door to heaven, and the Word became flesh. He was born in obscurity at Bethlehem, first only greeted by some shaggy shepherds. Yes, the Magi will come from the east, but he's going to have to flee to a foreign land of Egypt because a king has threatened his life. He'll be in 30 years of hidden obscurity before he launches his public ministry and mission. Many people still to this day confuse him and want to reduce him, Jesus, to being nothing more than a spiritual teacher, a guru, somebody who's just a moralist. If we reduce Jesus Christ to something of a spiritual guru, a teacher, and a moralist, we have misunderstood him. For his own claim, his own word, is that he is God. The Father and I is one, and there is no way to the Father but through me, he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he says, I am, he's invoking the divine name, the very one who from the bush to Moses many thousands of years ago said, I am who am. That is our God. When he went about the great work of our rescuing, our redeeming, our redemption, he did this by his suffering. From the agony of the garden to the height of Calvary upon the cross, he said, give me all of your brokenness. Give me the curse. Give me everything that would restrain you from God. If you've been captured, I'll be captured for you. Give me your doubts, your despair, your darkness. Give me your burdens, your worries, your anxieties. Give me your sin. Give me the forces of hell. Give me death itself. Give me your death, and I will die it for you, so you do not have to die eternally. That babe of Bethlehem, grown to a full man at 33, who is God in the flesh, went to the cross to suffer, to die, so to redeem and heal. On a Friday, men good called good, he did this work for us. He was taken down, buried in a stranger's tomb, a Friday passed to a Saturday, a Saturday to a Sunday, and on that Easter Sunday morning, he walked 
out of the tomb, risen, alive, glorious, triumphant, never capable of suffering again. And he says, if you abide in me and I in you, so too you will live forever. This Christmas morn, as you and I celebrate that little babe of Bethlehem, do you long for the life he has come to give? What awaits is a response. This is where I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable. I'm going to ask you to do the most important, daring thing possible. Let yourself be wounded by love. Let yourself be wounded by the love of Jesus Christ. Let that little baby pierce your heart. Let him change everything about you. Let him become your central priority, your most important focus, your best thoughts of the day, and your motivation for every action. Give him your heart this Christmas. Learn his ways with the use of your intellect. Learn through his church, his scriptures, his tradition. Learn the ways of faith and a moral life that is lived in union with him. As a new year comes upon us, maybe the most important thing you can do is to come to learn the ways of the Lord Jesus. But then, as love is always a mystery, give yourself generously to the mystery of the love of this Christ child. Through the celebrations of the sacrament of the church, through a life of prayer, through Christian community intentionally lived out, immerse yourself in the love of the babe of Bethlehem this Christmas into this new year and always. And I have this promise to you. It's not my promise. It's the promise of God. If you but let yourself be wounded by the perfect love of the babe of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, you will find healing. You will find hope. You will find health. You will find life. So let us run. Tarry no more. Go to the crib. See his little heart burning for love of you. And let us tell him, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm yours. Oh, my Jesus. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this Christmas morning, as we rejoice in the birth of our Savior, on this most holy day, when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior have appeared, let us pour forth our prayers. Let us pray for God's holy church, that in integrity of faith she may await and may welcome with joy him whom the Immaculate Virgin conceived by word and wondrously brought forth to birth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Let us pray for the world and our community, that all may come to know and experience God's personal love and providential care for the whole human race and for each and every individual person, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Let us pray for all who join us today for this Mass, that the grace of the Incarnation should be extended through each one of us in a humanity transformed in Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Let us pray for vocations, that young persons may have the prayerful disposition to discern God's voice in their lives and respond generously to priestly and religious calls. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Let us pray for those in need of God's mercy, that those oppressed by hunger, sickness, or loneliness may find relief in both mind and body. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our Let us pray for the holy souls, that the grace of Christ's saving presence in the flesh would serve to bring about the healing transformation of those who have died in his friendship, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O Lord our God, that the Virgin Mary, on this Christmas day, may commend the prayers of the faithful in your sight, for we make all of these through Christ our Lord.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Make acceptable, O Lord, our oblation on this solemn day when you manifested the reconciliation that makes us wholly pleasing in your sight and inaugurated for us the fullness of divine worship through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For in the mystery of the Word made flesh, a new light of your glory has shone upon the eyes of our mind, so that as we recognize in him God made visible, so we may be caught up through him in love of things invisible. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Samuel, our Bishop, and Jorge, his assistant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, in paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. Celebrating the most sacred day on which Blessed Mary, the Immaculate Virgin, brought forth the Savior for this world, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help through Christ our Lord, amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect, make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Grant, O merciful God, that just as in the Savior of the world born this day is the author of divine generation for us, so he may be the giver even of immortality, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.